Good afternoon and welcome to our response to today's homeschooling conference by Harvard. Um, this is a revision of a summit that was scheduled last year. This year's event is a little bit different and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But um, we are here under the Homeschool Freedom Project, which is a project of the Alliance, which represents state leaders of Christian homeschool organizations from across the country, Canada, and beyond. So I am Tara Bentley. I am the executive director for Indiana's state organization, and we have been serving homeschoolers since 1983. I'm joined by two other leaders who will introduce themselves as soon as they get started. Um, but we're here today to just have a round table discussion of the Harvard event from today. This year's response was titled the Post-Pandemic Future of Homeschooling Conference. Um, it was hosted by Harvard's Kennedy School. And we know that many people maybe aren't even aware of the history of this event and why it um, exists. And those of us who've been watching it since last year, we want to share a little bit about that. We know that we have many new homeschoolers who are brand new to homeschooling or brand new to this event overall. So Pam, why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about the history of the event. Hi, I'm Pamela Cashew. I'm the legislative liaison with Teach CT, the Education Association of Christian Homeschoolers of Connecticut. And the event is one that is really an alternative to the original Harvard Homeschool Summit. You'll notice that uh, today's event was hosted by the Kennedy School at Harvard. The original summit that people started to learn about was being hosted, I believe, um, at the Harvard Law School, and it was organized by the um, by Elizabeth Bartholet, who you saw uh, on today's panel. That uh, event was being scheduled about the same time that the, her Arizona Law Review was finally published, and a summary of that review was written about in the Harvard Law Review. That's how the general public became more aware of uh, her writings calling for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. And then we had COVID. And in March 2020, all of us were, quote, homeschooling. And that brings us to uh, today. So that's the background of the summit and the events. I can talk a little bit more about that law review article as we get further in the conversation. Great. So Tim, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how this event changed and where we are today. Okay. Uh, Tara, thanks for doing this. Um, I'm Tim Lambert, the president of the Texas Homeschool Coalition. We're the statewide advocacy organization for homeschoolers in Texas. We were started in 1984 and uh, continue to work to uh, promote and protect homeschooling in Texas. Uh, I think Pam's uh, description of the event was really good. Um, last year, this whole thing kind of blew up in their face. Uh, the original meeting was scheduled to be uh, an invitation only event and they were obviously only bringing uh, people or speakers that were uh, promoting their narrative that homeschooling was dangerous and uh, needed to be re re regulated, severely regulated by the state. Um, so it is interesting that they've, uh, that the, it was a different school. I think some of their moderators were much more balanced. Uh, obviously in this panel, you had Mike Donnelly from HSLDA and uh, another speaker who was, uh, was more balanced in his view of homeschooling. But it is clear to me, and I think uh, a couple of the other speakers that were here were scheduled for last year. They have a, what I would call a very skewed status view of homeschooling, uh, that parents uh, should have too much control over their children, that we need to protect children from, uh, from parents who regularly abuse and that sort of thing. Uh, so while their, their presentation was more balanced, I think the, the clear uh, uh, purpose of this meeting was to promote the narrative that, that homeschooling needs to be regulated and severely regulated across the states. 
So for all of us here, we are very like-minded. We're obviously pro-homeschooling, so you're not going to get some of the debate uh, that you may have had if you just got done watching the Harvard session from today. Um, if you are watching this and you did not get to participate yet and watch their session, um, they have made it known that they will be posting their playbacks. And so you may be watching these things out of order. And if that's the case, we'll post the link as soon as we get a hold of it. Um, I, my hand, I was writing so many notes. I know each of you were as well. So our goal was to provide somewhat of a concise response, but I think we've all agreed that we could spend hours discussing their hour, um, but we'll try not to do that. So <laughs> let's start with the agenda questions that they put out today. And I do think that they were a little more balanced than probably what we would have seen to the, um, any participants last year. But their first question um, was, is it time for a change to homeschool law? Uh, does the law on homeschooling need to be revised? What are appropriate restrictions on homeschooling? What rights should homeschoolers have? So knowing the history of the event, and we know it shifted just a little bit, but um, what does anyone think about the agenda behind these questions? And we'll start with you, Tim. Yeah, I think, I think clearly the agenda was the same as last year. Uh, I think they've recognized they had to package it to be a little bit more moderate to at least uh, give lip service to have uh, the viewpoint of the parental rights and the homeschooling community represented. Um, but it is clear if you, if you listen to uh, Bartholette, I mean, her opening comments were that uh, there's virtually no regulation of homeschooling and she's concerned about a quote unquote subset of uh, families. And when she's talking about that, if you know her background, she's talking about Christians and conservatives. Um, and so her, she right out of the box talked about the need to, uh, for some regulation, in fact, significant regulation of homeschooling to protect quote unquote children from uh, child abuse and neglect. She also talked at some point about um, helping children escape the culture of their parents. Yes. So I think that was some insight into uh, her worldview. And of course, uh, James Dwyer from uh, uh, Arizona also articulated that really parents having control over their children is like the state giving authority uh, for an adult over another adult. Um, so I think that was pretty indicative of where they intended to go. Um, but anyway, and, 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 we, and I was not disappointed. Uh, they were def definitely promote, promoting that narrative. Okay, Pam, what do you think? <laughs> um, they are promoting that narrative. They continue to do so. And I think despite the, their attempt to soften the comments, that they certainly intend to proceed trying to drive public opinion. Uh, I don't know if they'll make available the chat comments that were occurring during the presentation, but certainly the people who were listening to the call and chatting on the call recognized the narrative. It's, it's very transparent. And I, I think that the narrative has been there for a while. Most of us haven't seen it but uh, Connecticut, that they mentioned several times today with the Connecticut study, really is serving as a prototype for where they want to go with that narrative and why they're pushing so hard. One of the things that I didn't mention in the history of the events is that the Arizona Law Review that Bartholet wrote was actually available in draft form for about six months before it was finally published. It was available online. It went through at least one revision. And it's interesting to note, <clears throat> as I tell you a little bit more about Connecticut's history, that um, in the second uh, edition, in the revision, they added a requirement that all homeschool children be vaccinated and have those um, medical connections or checkups once a year. <clears throat> so they were setting the stage for where they were going in Connecticut. And 
Another thing that I didn't mention earlier is that Connecticut's child advocate, the person who wrote the report they wanted to talk about so much, was one of their featured speaker pan on a panel, featured speakers on a panel. And her topic was legislative strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that they aren't talking about this from a philosophical standpoint to have an end goal. And if you look at where Connecticut has been in the past two to three years, you'll see where they are, where they are going and their steps to do so. The year before the lockdowns and COVID, Connecticut fought a registration bill, a homeschool registration bill. We are currently a non-registration state and we were able to have that registration language removed from the bill. Then in 2020, they um, proposed the removal of the religious exemption for vaccines. Oh, there's that, that issue addressed again. And this year, sadly, they just passed the removal of the religious exemption of vaccines. They couldn't proceed because the legislature had to shut down, but they accomplished their goal. And the more frightening piece of where they're going is, <clears throat> if you'll remember the Connecticut report that they mentioned uh, was also mentioned in tandem with their lament that there's not enough data. So they definitely want our data and I think we're seeing a picture of how they're going to go about that in SB1 in Connecticut. The fact that it's number one bill means that it is one of their priorities. And section one of SB1 provides for an exit interview with students who withdraw from school. Uh, proponents said that it's limited to high school students. Nevertheless, in that exit interview, they will specifically ask whether or not the student's family was ever reported to DCF or child services. That's what it's known as in Connecticut. Not whether or not uh, there were ever any charges made or anything of that sort, simply whether or not they were reported. So they are looking to create that data and they are doing it uh, via bills like SB1 in Connecticut. That's enough for me for right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, you know, I know for me, some of the, we knew that we were getting a better perhaps uh, picture and a little bit more diversity than we would have seen last year, but it was still very clear that, you know, it was a very biased um, scope of the event, but we're biased. We're biased in a different direction. Um, and a couple of those words that to me really reflected um, the intent of some of the panelists were, right, it's a controversial movement, homeschooling as a controversial movement. And um, there was this constant use by Elizabeth of the term homeschool regime. So I don't know, I don't know if we're a part of the regime or not. Um, I don't have a card to prove it one way or the other. But um, just from the beginning, you could hear those charged words that really reflected um, their thoughts. And even from panelists who kind of described themselves as moderate, it was very surprising. So let's just start going through some of, um, some of the rest of today's content and specific takeaways that you might've had. So Tim, why don't you go ahead and start? Yeah, so I thought it was interesting that their question was, do we need, does there need to be a change in the law? I thought Mike Donnelly did a great job in saying, you know, there are changes in the law regarding homeschooling all the time. Uh, he cited South Dakota and West Virginia. The problem I think uh, most of the panelists had is those, those changes to the law are going the opposite direction that they want them to go. So these legal changes are giving parents more freedom, uh, less regulation and uh, oversight by the state. Um, I did, I, it was troubling to me, however, that, uh, uh, Eric uh, Barn or Warren was, uh, was, uh, pretty positive about homeschooling. He was talking about, uh, pods, home, um, you know, homeschool pods. And one of the things that disturbed me is he kind of acquiesced on the issue of child safety and, um, 
abuse and neglect by argue by saying that you know maybe it was a reasonable thing to have uh, regulation requiring doctors to uh, re, uh, look at kids once a year to be sure that they're safe. That means that uh, three of the four panelists supported that kind of uh, uh, interventionist statist approach. Uh, that was very troubling to me. Uh, and of course, I think um, Mike Donnelly did a great job of talking about that we have laws against abuse and neglect of children. And of course, I don't know that they talk a lot about those. Those laws are generally complaint based. You know, you don't you don't interview or examine every kid every year. You know, if there's a complaint, you investigate those complaints. So that was that was uh, that was troubling to me. Uh, but also, uh, one of my major takeaways was that um, they attacked. I mean, Bartholet attacked uh, our data, quote unquote. She was, I think, aiming this at Dr. Brian Ray, arguing that his his data was junk science. Uh, it was not supported. Uh, Donnelly did a great job of responding to that and saying that's not the only data out there. Um, so on the one hand, they're arguing that, and even Dwyer said this, Pam, related to the whole Connecticut study. Well, you, you can't look at the Connecticut study and argue that it's self-selecting and look at your other study and say it's not self-selecting. Uh, but I think Mike Donnelly did a great job of pointing out that there is some census data. There is some data that's not self-selecting that we can look at. But really, I think the big place they were going is we need data. We don't have data because homeschoolers are not required to regu uh, register. There's not this oversight and regulation by the state. So we really can't tell how homeschoolers are doing. So it's one of those things. We don't have data. We need data. So we need to regulate homeschoolers severely so we can get the data to see if they need to be regulated. Yes. So anyway, those were, those were probably my... I, 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 should, I just say one more takeaway that I thought was really good. One of the uh, primary moderators uh, kind of questioned James Dwyer in his, he made some comments about, you know, these, uh, you know, 36% of the public doesn't believe that Earth is round and some of these other outrageous percentages. And, and the moderator said, well, you know, uh, really, is that related to homeschooling? I mean, the vast majority of people are public schooling. Isn't that an indictment on public schooling? And Dwyer's response was, oh, no, that's an indictment on parenting. That's an indictment on parenting, not public education. So I, I, those were kind of some of my major takeaways. Yeah, I thought it was very interesting. There was a bit of a contradiction there. Um, I heard a couple times where I felt like Elizabeth was contradicting herself as well. Um, but I agree. The idea that homeschool families should have to go to two mandatory reporters was I think what he, he was suggesting and that then they have to sign off on our ability to homeschool, um, which was just, well, we'll be gracious. Um, so, okay, um, Pam, what were some of your key takeaways? Um, I just wanted to comment on um, uh, Tim's observation about Mr. Warren's being kind of okay trying I think he, he seemed to be searching for uh, some place where he could agree but I don't think that is his area of expertise so Mr. Wearns comes from a worldview if you will or a background <clears throat> of public education he worked for the state of Georgia uh, for the governor of Georgia uh, collecting data um, and although he is friendly towards homeschoolers he has uh, a background in teaching in both public schools and in private schools. As he mentioned, he currently is a teacher in one of the hybrid uh, schools. I think it's interesting that he talked about what hybrid homeschoolers like to call themselves, whether or not they want to call themselves private or public, depending on how much perhaps they want to deal with the government. I, I can't recall the exact distinction but I think it's important to remember his background when you consider uh, with when you consider what his stance was on uh, mandatory reporting or interaction. Uh, as for Dwyer, Dwyer's comments near the end about um, the parents, well, you know, the the mentally ill adults in our society are really due to their parenting at home. 
So Bartholate looks very uh, out there to us because she's clearly called for a presumptive ban on homeschooling. But Mr. Dwyer is just as <clears throat> um, extre extreme in his, his viewpoint because I was waiting for him to say, perhaps the better question is, do we need a change in parenting law? He seems to hold an elitist view that um, the government makes the better parent. And we don't have the time today to go into the, the research that shows that the government makes a very poor parent. In fact, when the government insists on parenting, often we left with, we're left with a child who is stuck in the middle between a parent who, however loving, may now be uh, powerless to act, and a government that once they get their data or their ruling, then abandons the child. Uh, I've seen this in research for uh, the way family courts operate because of uh, that re report from the Connecticut Child Advocate, I went off on some bunny trails of my own learning about how DCF works. It was not good information. So the government makes a very poor parent. And I think that the other people in the chat recognized where he was going with that. They were highly insulted. The assertions by Dwyer and Bartholay that that's our history, that our rights come from the government, um, are easily refuted. Mike Donnelly and others at HSLDA have written articles about uh, the history of how we are giving consent to the government, but it originates with us. So that, that was my takeaway, that don't, don't be uh, deceived to think that Ms. Bartley is the one that... Um, is the most extreme in the room. I think that one, this might be a good time to actually talk about a couple thoughts. And that is, you know, what is the importance of this event? Um, when this event was first, you know, when it first started making the rounds in social media, most of us as state leaders were aware of this event back in January of 2020. Um, but then just before the pandemic hit, the event became more publicly known and homeschoolers, um, on social media were obviously concerned, right? This was before we knew what was gonna happen with homeschooling. They were very concerned. And there was a lot of calls to action from different things of um, complaining to Harvard, even though it wasn't technically Harvard. And then there were also um, cries to say, you know, oh, we need to go warn our legislators. And, and that's really not, it's not really how that works. Um, and this is basically, this is an academic event um, to present ideas and discussion. And so I think that our role here as state leaders is to say, you know, if you value homeschooling, then you need to be aware. You need to be aware of these agendas. You need to be aware of these issues. And you also need to be aware that, um, well, hopefully that you support your state organization. I'm just gonna throw that out there because as state leaders, all of us and our peers um, across the country, we're the ones at our state house fighting these data bills, fighting these vaccine bills. And um, we do it all year long. And we're very grateful to all of our friends in national organizations and in research, but um, you have to know what's going on in your state. Um, you know, when Mike Donnelly put up that uh, graphic of when the laws changed, I mean, it's the state, right? It's not the nation, it's not the federal, it's not Harvard. Harvard will never control your right to homeschool. It's going to be your state. So I think that's um, very important. This is just an academic discussion that they're having. And the way for people and parents to get involved is going to be at the state level. And that's where they need to be aware and to know these agendas and know what's going on in Connecticut, not because you necessarily live in Connecticut, but because these trends move across the country. I would, I would, I totally agree with that. And I would just, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a, actually toward the end of a legislative session in Texas now. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is interesting, you know, one of the things that we're seeing about a lot of the new homeschool families is they are really overwhelmed. They're really focused on how do I do this? And so for many of them, I know in Texas, they are 
really taking for granted that where we are today is where we've always been and right. where we always will be. And obviously, I think, that, I think that's what you're referring to, Tara, is we have to be uh, vigilant. Our state organizations uh, really are focused on that. And, and what we're talking about here, and I think you really made the point, is this is a PR event. So this is an attempt by people who really believe that, that you can't trust parents, that homeschooling is not good, that the state should severely regulate. In fact, Bartholet's position is that you've got to get permission from the, from the state to homeschool. So that's their agenda. And this is an effort on their part to give what I might call academic uh, support uh, to those ideas. Uh, it, well, I, I, I thought it was interesting. Pam pointed out that the, that the comments in the chat were very much trending against uh, those positions. But it is important for, for families to understand and to know that our, uh, what we like to say in Texas is every time the legislature meets, no man's freedom or property is safe. You know, so we make sure that, the legis that we've got people in the legislature and, and you refer to this, uh, you know, what we've seen in Texas re with regard to the, and of course I realize every state is different, but we have some friends, we've been watching the vaccine issue for years and really what happened, Texas just passed a uh, legislation to, um, to prohibit the state from mandating vaccines. And it's because there was a pushback against this whole mandatory vaccines that kind of came up during the pandemic. So, but, but I totally agree with you. You're exactly right. We've got to be informed. Uh, we've got to watch what's going on. We have to support our organizations that are on the vanguard of uh, protecting our freedoms and, and paying attention to what's going on in our states. I agree. And when it comes to being informed, I have heard some people say, well, that's what you do. And I understand when you're homeschooling your children, you don't have time to do the research that a state leader might. But I would ask that as you see stories about homeschooling in the news, that you look at it with um, an analytical eye. I, I, saw, I see that more people are doing that. I saw evidence of that in the chat and the comments. Um, but as, as Tim mentioned earlier, Follow the worldview. You know, you've heard the phrase, follow the money. I think that's very helpful, but also follow the worldview. What is that person's background? Um, where are they coming from when they address the question? And then you might also ask, uh, is this statement or narrative meant to drive my emotions? Because a couple of years ago, like Tim mentioned, we saw all of the abuse cases being discussed in the media. It was uncanny how common the phrasing was in stories that were published across the country. And I, I saw one of those happening after the lockdown. So uh, beginning in March, I think it was March 13th because I, I follow cases of child abuse. I saw a common phrase being used in articles that came in came up across the country, and that was child abuse calls are down, and that's not good. Yes. Go Google it. Child mm -hmm. abuse calls are down, and that's not good. Uh, they wanted you to, uh, to believe that schools, public schools, are the safer place for children to be. And so when you see that being repeated, that's a part of that narrative. It isn't limited to emotion. Some of it includes um, their appeal to being the better resource. And that's where they want to go after the data. But these are just part of our job to educate you so that you know what to look for. So that when a bad bill does come in your state, you will understand why we're saying it may not look bad on its face, but here's what's going on behind it. Or why are we talking about vaccines when we're a homeschool group? It really has to do when you remove the religious exemption with parental rights. And that's what they would like to extinguish. 
Well, let's see. I think that we all agree we could keep going, um, but we don't want to wear our audience out. So let me wrap up with a couple of thoughts. And one would be that we just represent three states right here today, but we are a part of, um, I, I dare, dare I say, homeschool regime. There are There's a homeschool network out there to help you within your state because it really matters where you live, that you know the homeschool law in your state. So on our website, homeschoolfreedom.com, you can find your state organization. We really encourage you to get connected with them. And we hope that you'll join us and keep this conversation going in our discussion group on Facebook for Homeschool Freedom. Because as, as I know, we want this conversation to continue. Many of you do as well. And the comments in the chat were just, they were, they were beautiful. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote someone here from the chat. Her name was Jenna Ellis, and I'm giving her credit because she did a great job. She said, we never presumptively foreclose parental rights based on a subset. And I think that that, to me, was a great summary of um, all of the arguments that were being presented. And I'm very grateful for her succinctly um, typing out a great conclusion for me. Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Tara, just, just one comment to piggyback on what you just mentioned there. Um, Pam was talking about this narrative that we're going to see more, the whole idea of the Bartholet's latest article that I read prior to the, as the, as the pandemic was advancing, was that we're going to see all these other people homeschooling and we're very likely to see an increase in child abuse cases. And of course, that's why they were so upset that child abuse cases were going down. So anyway, great job. Uh, I'm really excited about our responses here and uh, they've got what, six or seven more of these things to go weekly? Six more weeks. Yes, six more weeks. Six more. <laughs> so we will be back. It may not be the same three people, but uh, we definitely will be back providing responses every week. Um, Pam, I'll let you give the final word before we sign off. Tara, I want to thank you for giving um, us this opportunity to address what was going on at this program, what it means for homeschoolers across the country, and how they can interact with state homeschool organizations so that if they are attacked in their state, they can work with us to fight back the bad bills and the status view that we are seeing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. And we hope to see you next week.